Across the Atlantic, England's King George III is losing his patience. His colonies are acting like petulant children. These are his subjects, Englishmen, born in America, but Englishmen just the same. He is their ruler, and it's because of them that his empire is going broke. A decade ago, he sent British troops across the ocean to defend the colonies against French settlers and their Indian allies. The war went on for seven years, and it cost England 60 million pounds, money it now desperately needs. There's a sense that after the Seven Years' War that um, America ought to pay its way a little bit. That expenses to protect North America should in part be raised in North America. Parliament's solution is unprecedented. The Stamp Act of 1765 directly taxes colonies by having them pay for stamps that must be affixed to virtually every piece of paper they touch. From official documents to playing cards. It goes badly from the start. The colonists resent not only paying the tax, but also having it imposed by a faraway parliament where no one represents them. Though the Crown appoints colonial governors and high officials, each colony is long accustomed to ruling itself and levying its own taxes. The Americans believed that over 150 years of being colonists, they had in a sense created a nation within the British Empire. They had free assemblies, democratically elected. They had free and independent and very good newspapers. They had a, their own tax system. It wasn't just paying a little bit of money. The notion was that other people were making them pay money. So it's an emotional issue. Who's in control here? We want to control our own lives, which includes, of course, our own pocketbooks. In 1765, a new generation of colonists is rushing headlong down an uncharted path to an unknown end. And the Stamp Act is what starts it. Much of the spirit, if not the exact words, is don't you see what they're up to? Don't you see what's going on? There's a strategy at work here to gradually erode American liberties. If you let them do this, what will they try to do next? For the British, the tax isn't about eroding liberties. It's about money. Stoking the colonial reaction is a powerful underground movement known as the Sons of Liberty. They meet secretly in taverns across the colonies and come up with every tactic they can to keep government officials from collecting England's tax. People really started forming alliances between kind of street theater, street gangs, and merchants and artisans, and figuring out ways uh, to all work towards the common cause, which is to repeal the Stamp Act. Soon enough, things begin to get ugly. Intimidation is a favorite weapon. Those who remain loyal to the king, known as loyalists or Tories, often find themselves terrorized by these self-anointed patriots. They often use very dramatic techniques, tar and feathering, for instance. This is a, a great way to humiliate people. First, you're stripped naked. The bucket of tar is heated and you're coated with tar. And then they put these feathers, these goose feathers, all over you, and you're all hot, and you're branching about like a silly goose. After a display like this, how is this person going to publicly oppose the Patriot position? A loyalist printer in New York City uh, publishes a loyalist newspaper, and they come in and smash his printing press, while they are also proclaiming free speech as a principle to fight for. That's the nature of war and the nature of revolution. While the angry rabble takes to the streets, men of property and education use printing presses and politics to denounce the Stamp Act tax. One of the most outspoken is 29-year-old John Adams, a bright, ambitious attorney who brings logic and intellect to this very emotional argument. He drafts anti-tax resolutions for some 40 Massachusetts assemblies. 
We have always understood it to be a grand and fundamental principle of the English Constitution that no free man should be subject to any tax to which he has not given his own consent. John Adams. Adams has always envisioned great things for himself, and the cause of liberty presents the opportunity of a lifetime. His wife, Abigail, is his trusted confidant and partner in all things, great and small. I think it's hard to overestimate the importance of Abigail Adams. I mean, not only is she more than an equal partner um, to her husband, but she comes to this contest with really perfectly formed ideas about which she feels passionately. She's an enormous influence on her husband. One day, these two will be counted among the founders of a new nation. For now, John Adams is one of many voices of protest in a Stamp Act rebellion that engulfs all 13 colonies. Down in Virginia, a fiery young legislator named Patrick Henry ups the ante. Resolved that the inhabitants of this colony are not bound to yield obedience to any law or ordinance designed to impose any taxation whatsoever other than the laws of their own General Assembly. Patrick Henry. In other words, no taxation without representation. Henry's Virginia resolves become a radical touchstone for all the colonies. Three thousand miles away in London, another important player in the colonial drama, America's Benjamin Franklin, is doing what he does best, playing chess, flirting with a pretty young thing, and keeping an eye on developments for his countrymen. Franklin becomes the point man. He is the man in England who is there essentially trying to hammer out some kind of compromise on issues of taxation with the crown. At 59, Franklin is the most famous American in the world. He has spent the better part of two decades in England as a trade representative and the colony's unofficial ambassador wooing and wowing a London society with his wit and wisdom. This is the Philadelphia printer and writer who created Poor Richard's Almanac, the colony's best-selling annual, rich with homespun advice. He is the scientist who famously flew a kite to experiment with electricity, who invented the lightning rod and the bifocal. A self-made man who went from lowly apprentice to wealthy entrepreneur, Franklin is the embodiment of what it means to be an American. Yet he adores England, the mother country, and especially London. He's absolutely in his element. This is where the great center of science is at this point. It's, it's, a, it's like being in the city as opposed to having been in the country. He's really hit uh, the right group of people. And he's very much, he, he raised these down as the happiest years of his life. Now, the uprising at home has put Franklin at center stage, a place he generally enjoys. London's baffled politicians come pounding on his door, desperate for a solution to the problem, hoping he can use his considerable influence to bring the colonists to their senses. But it's business, not politics, that settles the matter. The decisive blow is the blow to the British pocketbook. North American merchants said, well, okay, while the Stamp Act is in place, we're just not going to trade with you. It's a way of getting merchants in England to say, if this is going to ruin business, then the Stamp Act's got to go. Now England's merchants and bankers are feeling the pinch from the loss of business created by colonial boycotts, and they too start railing against the Stamp Act. The tax crisis has become just too big a headache. And in March 1766, a beleaguered parliament finally repeals the Stamp Act. Unbelievably, the people of the colonies have forced the world's greatest power to back down. The rebel colonists can celebrate their first sweet taste of victory and of power. But the battles are far from over. England still needs the money and still needs to show who's boss. Over the next four years, Parliament devises new taxes, which trigger renewed upheaval and end up being repealed. 
As this seemingly endless cycle continues, England dispatches two military regiments to Massachusetts from New York to keep order, adding fuel to the fire. In 1768, four more regiments sail from England on a collision course with America. Boston, 1770. 1,000 British troops occupy this city of 15,000. It is a volatile brew. Boston is an accident waiting to happen, literally. Conditions are rife. We've got an indigenous population that is very, very sensitive to having British soldiers quartered amongst them. You have all of these British regiments in Boston. This is something that, that the Bostonians simply chafe under. Resentment grows against the soldiers in Boston streets. On the night of March 5th, a band of local patriots heckles a British sentry standing guard at the customs house. At first, they merely hurl insults, but soon they're hurling snowballs, and eight more soldiers come to the aid of their comrade. You have a group of men who are egging on British soldiers, looking for ways to kind of stir up a fight. And now they've created the antagonism that they've been trying to gin up. Hundreds more colonists pour into the street. They launch a barrage of ice, oyster shells, and rocks at the soldiers. The guards panic. Their guns go off. And when it's over, five civilians lay dead on the frozen street. It was a tragically predictable sort of event. It's one of those situations in which the soldiers that are there to impose order are actually that seed of discontent that's going to produce disorder. Within hours of the deadly shootings, the Patriot spin machine roars into high gear. A tragic accident is recast as a murderous crime against the colonial people in what becomes known as the Boston Massacre. This was not remotely a massacre. This was a case in which a mob assailed a small detachment of British soldiers, which may have panicked but had very legitimate cause to fear for their well-being. But that's not how it's portrayed to the outside world. A local silversmith and artisan named Paul Revere renders an exaggerated version of the event that makes it look like an unprovoked slaughter by the British soldiers. Boston papers are quick to print and distribute Revere's version. And this becomes the Patriot image of the Boston Massacre, which shows the British lined up in a row, firing their muskets all at once, as if they got the command to fire, which didn't happen that way. The first to die in the gunfire is a black man, a sailor and runaway slave named Crispus Attucks. He is widely viewed as the first martyr of the American Revolution. In this explosive atmosphere, the public outcry pressures the British to pull their troops out of Boston. The soldiers responsible for the so-called massacre are put on trial for murder, and they are hard-pressed to find an attorney to take their case. Surprisingly, one of Boston's most vocal patriots steps forward, John Adams. Adams is willing to risk everything, his and his family's safety, and his reputation as an ardent advocate of colonial rights. But he believes passionately in the right to a fair trial. Without human rights, the Patriot cause isn't worth fighting. It was one of the best pieces of service I ever rendered. Judgment of death against these soldiers would have been a foul stain upon this country. John Adams. Adams wins an acquittal for seven of the soldiers and light sentences for the other two. Only his unquestioned devotion to the Patriot cause keeps him from being branded a traitor. The crisis is resolved for now. Back in England, the colonial rebellion becomes a national preoccupation. 
Over the next three years, Parliament keeps trying to impose its authority with new laws and new taxes. As each new law inflames the rebellion, it ends up getting repealed. Except for one, a tax on tea. The principle involved is that Parliament is sovereign, it can pass laws on whatever it wants. So we're going to just keep this one in place, just because, to assert the fact that we can do this. The Tea Act puts only a three-penny tax per pound on the drink of choice for most Americans. It's hardly a burden, but in the current climate, a three-penny tax still equals oppression. It's all that militant patriots need to strike another blow against the empire. Feathers and coal dust are their weapons. On December 16, 1773, the Sons of Liberty enlist 50 men to darken their faces, stick feathers in their hair, and arm themselves with hatchets in a bad impersonation of Mohawk Indians. 5,000 people follow them down to Boston Harbor and watch as they climb aboard a merchant ship loaded with tea from England. With British soldiers absent since the Boston Massacre, there is no one to stop them. 342 crates of tea worth 10,000 British pounds are cast overboard. This wanton act of sabotage, which becomes known as the Boston Tea Party, will soon push the two sides to the brink of war. The British reaction was disgust and outrage. From a British point of view, you had an entire colony running amok. And the British government, after the Tea Act, frankly said, we've had enough. We've had enough of Massachusetts. And we're going to clamp down on them. And we're going to make Massachusetts an example of what happens if you defy the authority of Parliament. At that very same time, the British discover yet another outrage committed by an American, someone they thought they could trust. Benjamin Franklin. Over a year ago, Franklin was passed a stolen packet of confidential letters written to a British official by Massachusetts Governor Thomas Hutchinson. Ever since Stamp Act rioters tore down Hutchinson's house nine years earlier, he had tried to juggle serving his king with serving his angry fellow citizens. The letters given to Franklin exposed Hutchinson's true loyalist sympathies. There must be an abridgment of what are called English liberties. I'd wish for the good of the colony to see some further restraint of liberty rather than the connection with the parent state should be broken. Thomas Hutchinson. Franklin sent the incriminating letters to colonial assemblymen in Massachusetts who had recently made them public as irrefutable proof of Hutchinson's treachery against the Patriot cause. The reaction in the colonies was torrential. Mobs burned Hutchinson's effigy. The press vilified it. By December, when the Patriot Raiders throw the Boston Tea Party, they have destroyed Hutchinson's long career as a public servant. Within six months, Thomas Hutchinson will pack up his family and sail to England. The relentless strife that has set American against American will force this man, long devoted to colonial causes, into exile. Heartbroken, he will never again set foot in his beloved homeland. Now, in London in January 1774, Benjamin Franklin is summoned to appear before the King's Council. On the heels of the recent looting of the tea in Boston Harbor, Franklin's recently revealed role in the Hutchinson fiasco is more than British officials can tolerate. He must answer for his sins and the sins of his countrymen. Franklin is dressed down by the Solicitor General of England for a full hour in the strongest possible language. I mean, it's really abusive language. In front of a crowd, is going wild at this venomous attack. And Franklin stands stock still in this humiliating moment, you know, head erect and doesn't say a word for an hour. Many people have dated that as the moment at which Franklin becomes a revolutionary. 
Franklin the revolutionary is done with England. And England is done with him. Parliament punishes Massachusetts with a vengeance. It revokes the colony's 80-year-old charter, dissolves its local assemblies, and after a four-year absence, sends 3,000 troops to reoccupy Boston. The Crown now runs Massachusetts. These people had been meeting in town meetings for 150 years. When they can no longer decide their own fate, they said, this is the end. People throughout Massachusetts rose up as one and said, no way. There is no turning back for either side. The tension between the people of Massachusetts and the British troops becomes unbearable. It's only a matter of time before someone fires the shot that will echo around the world. Boston, August 10th, 1774. John Adams is donning a new suit. And if he's not careful, the British will bury him in it. The Patriot leader is heading for a secret meeting in Philadelphia that will change the course of history and could cost him his life. Adams is one of four men representing Massachusetts at the First Continental Congress, an unprecedented and, as far as the king is concerned, illegal meeting of delegates from up and down the colonies. Fifty-five delegates of America's best and brightest who gather to come up with a unified strategy to oppose Britain's increasing encroachment on their liberties. If the king had his way, they would all hang for treason. That illustrates how strongly they felt that they must take steps to remove themselves from the, what they saw as the arbitrary power of the British crown. Britain has already suspended Massachusetts' constitution and imposed martial law there. The other colonies fear that it's only a matter of time before they all meet the same fate. Even though these colonies have different economic interests, they have different political histories, they have different populations, they recognize that in our relationship with Britain, we have much in common. Not all of these people have met each other. Most have heard about each other. Now they're eager to meet each other, see what's going to happen. People know that there's going to be moderates and not so moderates. And there's already kind of little factions forming. Joining John Adams from Massachusetts is another radical, 37-year-old John Hancock, a wealthy Boston merchant who has been using his considerable fortune to fuel the cause. Pennsylvania has sent a moderate lawyer, John Dickinson, 42, whose widely read essays back in the 60s helped launch the anti-tax movement. From Virginia comes Patrick Henry, the volatile young orator whose Virginia resolves helped stamp out the Stamp Act. And also from Virginia, a wealthy 42-year-old planter and veteran of the Seven Years' War, George Washington. One of the problems is they all thought of themselves as Pennsylvanians, Rhode Islanders, South Carolinians, much more than they thought of themselves as Americans. Patrick Henry really just electrifies everyone when he says, I am no longer a Virginian, I am now an American. John Adams says the trick is to get 13 clocks to strike all at the same time, 13 ships to sail in the same formation. Uh, it's not easy. 13 conspirators against the crown. Finally, after two months of arguing and pontificating, the Congress adjourns with a unified message for England. Until colonial rights are restored, all 13 colonies will halt all trade with Great Britain. Local militias are to arm and stand in readiness. As one might expect, kings don't do well with ultimatums. No one tells the King of England what to do. The die is now cast. The colonies must either submit or triumph. I do not wish to come to severer measures, but we must not retreat. I trust they will come to submit. 
he makes the assumption that a simple show of force, of military might, will be enough to scare the rebels back to their senses. Not likely. Certainly not in Boston. The city is a tinderbox waiting to explode. The British have turned it into a virtual police state. They have sealed off Boston Harbor, disbanded the colonial assemblies, and forced locals to house British troops. The man in charge is Commanding General Thomas Gage. His orders are to quash the rebellion. And while he has the guns, the rebels have the numbers. He repeatedly asks the Crown for a larger army. Thomas Gage only has 3,000 soldiers in Boston. He's looking at 5,000 in Worcester County, 4,000 in Plymouth, all over like this. He's looking at this. He says, what am I going to do with my 3,000 people against force like this? He's playing a losing hand. He can't do anything, for which he is called an old woman. He's very much a man in between. He's a military officer who is charged with a political task for which he's not really equipped to handle. With Hutchinson's departure, Gage is now Massachusetts governor and commander of an occupying army that no longer faces a small rebellion. It is a population in uprising. They start smuggling cannons out of Boston and they start purchasing arms, and the militiamen start training, and they form the Minutemen. They actually sign associations. Uh, I will mobilize on a minute's notice. This is no longer a skirmish over taxes. The Patriots believe their way of life, their liberty, and their property are at stake. Nothing short of war will settle it. In April 1775, Gage gets orders from England to break the uneasy stalemate. He will send a full force out to the countryside to seize a huge store of rebel ammunition. Unknown to Gage, Parliament, King George, or anyone else, the fate of the British Empire hangs on this decision. April 18th, 1775. British troops are on the march. Colonial militia are arming and stockpiling ammunition for what many fear is an inevitable showdown. British Commander General Thomas Gage has ordered his soldiers to capture a huge hidden store of gunpowder in Concord, a Massachusetts village 20 miles west of Boston. The British detachment that marches out of Boston, roughly 800 soldiers, march out knowing that the countryside is on the verge of armed action. Once Gage sends that mission out, he really has set into motion a chain of events that is beyond his ability to control. The British are indeed coming. The news starts leaking out and people start mobilizing. They're ready. Out into the countryside to spread the word goes Paul Revere, whose engraving of the Boston Massacre fanned the flames of outrage five years earlier. Poems and school books will one day mythologize Revere's midnight ride as if he were the lone heroic messenger. But in fact, he is just one part of a whole system of communication. Paul Revere is one of dozens, then scores, and literally hundreds of messengers going every which way. Bells are ringing, the shots are being fired. And so before dawn, hours before dawn, the whole countryside is mobilized and knows what's happening. They arrange a signal. One lantern light in Boston's Old North Church if the British are coming by land, and two if by boat. British troops row to the Cambridge side of the Charles River and wade through reeds and thick marshland to begin their overnight march to Concord. At around one in the morning at Lexington, Massachusetts, farmers, blacksmiths, and shopkeepers gather to intercept the British at Lexington Green. 130 civilians, some too old, some too young, most with no formal military experience, stand ready to risk it all 
against the world's most feared army. These were men who, who literally felt under attack. And in fact, they were under attack. The, the British army were walking out to seize colonial property and they felt compelled to defend it. 2 a.m. After an hour of waiting, no sign of the British. The night's chill sends many home. Others choose nearby Buckman's Tavern to await another alarm. Most hoping it will never come. Four thirty a.m. Drums announce that the British are on their way. I'm sure the mood on Lexington Green was extremely tense. The best trained, most professional army in the world is bearing down on them. So even though they were fired up with a great sense of injustice, they were probably nervous. And if they weren't, they should have been. Both sides eye each other suspiciously, both sides not wanting to take a misstep. All of a sudden, a single shot is fired. Nobody knows who fired the shot. After the war and investigations, nobody ever found out. As soon as that shot was fired, both sides commenced firing at will, and the American Revolution was on. In less than two minutes, eight militiamen lay dead, ten wounded. It really lit up the, the newspapers everywhere. Blood had been shed, and there was really no looking back after that.